everyone to a breath brush marketing. I'm your host, Melissa Siudakis, and I'm here today with Harmonica Sunbeam, who is a delightful performer, activist, role model, known for her work with uplifting projects such as Drag Queen Story Hour, as well as her colorful and longstanding career in the entertainment industry. Harmonica, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we finally got a chance to make it happen. So, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, I have been uh, doing drag for a, a little bit over 30 years at this point. Um, it's something that um, I never thought that I would actually be doing. It just kind of happened. And, um, I, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Nice, nice. Are you willing to share what inspired your name? What inspired my name? Well, okay. So when I was first coming out in, in high school and, and finding myself, uh, I watched Female Troubles by John Waters. And so we all, me and my two close friends at that time, uh, we all had drag names. We, we created these drag names and um, just for, you know, for fun. And um, so my name was Macadamia Serendipity because I like macadamia nuts. Nice. And so I <laughs> kind of thought that would be like a little lengthy to put on a marquee. So even though I wasn't serious, I was thinking far ahead. You know what I'm saying? You know, and so um, I changed it to Tequila Sunrise. Okay. Which a lot of drag queen names are like very cliche-ish or double entendres, things of that, you know, things of that nature. And, um, but I also thought that was a very common name. Mm -hmm. That could be a possibly common name, you know. And um, from there, it morphed into Harmonica Sunbeam. I'm not exactly sure how it went from one to the other. I, I'm assuming that I somehow wanted the sun in the name as well, but I don't. I'm, I I can't remember now how it got to that. But I think when you first hear the name Harmonica Sunbeam, it um, it sounds very inviting, very friendly. Uh, uh, and it may sound a little weird. Someone says, well, th those two words put together is a little strange. Mm -hmm. you know? But when you get to make up your own name, you want to have something that's that's definitely a part of you and that and that is unique, uniquely yours. And the thing with the double entendres uh, and the cliches is that uh, way before the Internet, of course, that's when I started. Yes, you being um, Anita Green Card was very funny in Texas, mm -hmm. but you, you had no clue that there were 10 others in St. Louis, right. Chicago, you know what I mean? Because they all thought it was funny, but the internet brought us all together. Right. And now with mainstream shows like RuPaul's Drag Race, the name that you have uh, may be the same name as someone else now who has TV exposure, which kind of trumps you even if you've been doing it longer, because now this person has a bigger uh, a bigger platform than you. And so now you look kind of like you copied off of them, so to speak, even though you may be 15 years older than this person, they will go to, if they say the name Anita Green Card, the first person they think of is the girl from the show now, as opposed to you. Right. And actually so. I saw a commercial on TV the other day, it was either for like, Visa or MasterCard, it was one of the major credit card companies. And they said, you can now put whatever your name is that you choose on your credit card. <laughs> so, you know, they, they did like a whole thing, you know, supporting LGBTQ and- um, Okay. And yeah, and I just saw it the other day. So you could actually put Harmonica Sunbeam on your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> it would be pretty cool though. Um, yeah, yeah, it would be, it would be. <laughs> it's just that then, you know, like sometimes some places may ask you for ID matching the card. So then it gets a little funky. Well, that's, yeah, but they, they were talking about that though. They said, mm -hmm. now you can identify with however you identify and no one's going to look at you different because they said, if your license doesn't match and that's your card, like they have a way okay. of, yeah, well, like they figured it out for you. Most of them, times, times have really changed, you yeah. know, and, um, and that, and that's a good thing, you know, and I'm glad that more people are accepting of other people and their, and their rights and their feelings and their beliefs. 
You right. know, um, you know, we're from the era. Well, I, I am at least from the era where we just kind of like lumped everyone together and we brushed off anything that was necessarily different. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, we've definitely evolved over time. Uh, that that's for sure. So, and I like seeing commercials where it's like, okay, good. You know, Visa, Mastercard, they're getting on the ball here. Um, but, and then, you know, you can even do, they probably do um, like photograph on the credit card. So it'll be, right. you, and then right, like, right. You, yeah. You can be like, yeah, that's my <laughs> name. <laughs> um, so where are you from originally? I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. And I currently live in, in Jersey City where I've been here for a, a number of years. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm in New York. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. And I moved close, I moved to Jersey City to be closer to New York. Um, I guess I worked at Radio City for 19 years from uh, 1988 to 2007 wow. uh, until I could no longer be a rockette. And um, no, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I worked there. So that was my whole thing, like, you know, like uh, taking the PATH train all over New Jersey Transit back to Newark and then either having the to get home in time to catch the bus or spend a lot of money on a cab. So I was like, okay, Jersey City, if I can live close enough to the train station where I can just walk home, this is this is where I need to be. And um, so this is where I am and I'm most comfortable because it's a nice balance between uh, the work that I do in New York as well as the work I do all over New Jersey, so. That was great. And you've been an entertainer for pretty much 30 years. So, mm -hmm. so what were you doing at Radio City? I worked in the guest relations department. Uh, so basically that's, you know, like customer service, uh, like the ushers, the ticket takers, all that kind of stuff. And it was great for me because it, uh, even though it was a part-time job, uh, you had access to full-time hours when we were specifically uh, uh, very busy for particular events, you know, definitely the Christmas show and maybe an event that may have come for like a, two or three weeks, like, you know, like the, uh, the, the Price is Right, uh, maybe uh, like when we had the Lion, premiere of the Lion King movie, you know, uh, the Easter show when they brought that back. So things of that nature that, you know, but it gave me, an, it always gave me enough time to, um, to free time to be creative, to still explore my own personal creative endeavors. And that's what I like, you know, I've never really been uh, that great at being a nine to five kind of set schedule person. So mm. this being like having some downtime and some busy time at Radio City was really um, uh, good for me. Nice. So uh, can you also talk about your nonprofit work that you've done? Well, I work, I work with a nonprofit agency called Drag Queen Story Hour, but I know you want to talk about that a little bit later. But um, I've also worked with a lot of uh, health and uh, AIDS organizations uh, doing nonprofit work. Um, and I worked with Hyacinth AIDS Foundation for a number of years. Um, and uh, it's something that's, that's near and dear to me as a person who has um, lived through the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and seeing this devastation and, and lost so many people that I you know that you know I felt compelled to to help others and to to get the message out about uh, safe safer sex and prevention and all of those things and taking care of ourselves mm -hmm. so that uh, other people would wouldn't uh, run the misfortune of uh, the people that I grew up with who had uh, didn't have these resources. Yeah. or didn't have a fighting chance because we didn't know a lot. Yeah, and, and, and that's a big deal. It's, it's really the education behind it. Right. Understanding the right things to do to right. protect yourself. So, um, you know, it's, it's nice to give back. It's, you know, definitely unfortunate to hear that you've, you've lost uh, people that were close to you um, from AIDS. So I'm um, very sorry to hear that. So... <clears throat> So talk to, talk to me about some projects that you're currently working on that you'd like to share. Hmm. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily have anything that I think, that I think of major, uh, but uh, we just finished Pride Month, which was June, right? But uh, Jersey City has their Pride in August. And I work uh, in Jersey, I live in Jersey City and I, I posted Jersey City Pride for a number of years. So, so I'm gonna use July to kind of like take it a little bit easy 
um, and then gear up for all of these prizes because August is also Hudson Pride Month. So all the um, all the cities within Hudson County will have different pride offerings and things of that nature. So um, I'm starting now to field calls and opportunities to come and do different types of events for all that stuff uh, starting in August. You know, I recently auditioned for some things and I didn't necessarily get them. So, you know, uh, it's like, you know, it's part of like the, the whole acting life, you know, she's like, oh, you go ahead, you audition. And you don't even think about it again unless you get a call because that way, if you don't get the call, you've already moved on with your life, you know? <laughs> I, like, I like the way you're thinking about it. That, that works. Like, why stress over it? And be like, right, oh, right. Call me, don't call me. Yeah, so. because a lot of times, you know, film and TV happens very fast. So, you know, like, if you auditioned on Wednesday and you haven't heard anything by Friday, keep it moving. <laughs> right. On to the next, right? Yeah. So, while the average person knows what drag is, there isn't a lot of in-depth discussion about it in general communities. Can you, can you give an expert's opinion on what drag is about? And can you kind of talk about like how drag is part of your life? And is it one of those things where you only kind of dress up when you're going to entertain or like do you dress up and go food shopping or do you not? Or can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Okay. For me, drag, you know, drag is a, a, a form of self-expression and a form of creativity, right? And I feel that we all do drag to a degree, whether we uh, admit it or not, you know? If you, the, the, you know, anytime I tell, and I even tell, you know, the kids this, anytime that we dress up more fabulously than we do normally, that is a form of drag. When you go to a wedding or, you know, or you go for a court appearance or a big party, <laughs> you know, you're not going to wear, you know, the same thing you wear to, to Walmart. When you, anytime we put, you know, any amount of effort, you know, like people say, oh, this is, this is my work drag, you know, like when they go to work, you know, when, when we, you put on your three-piece suit and you put on your heels, you know, but then it's like, after that, you would never catch me looking like that because the you know, it's, that's your time to like uh, dress up and express yourself, even if you are sort of forced to because of how your work environment might be, you know. Um, so that that's my take on drag. Um, but I, I personally only do drag necessarily for work. Uh, so if you see me in drag, I am either going to work or coming from work. Um, there have been times where I have... Uh, popped into the bank and drag to deposit some checks or do, do some banking business, uh, you know, on my way to or from work or even at the supermarket or something like that. But it's definitely work related in a sense. Like I wouldn't necessarily get dressed up just to go to something. Like I have had meetings with people uh, for potential gigs and opportunities. And they said, oh, I, I thought you were going to come dressed up. There's no reason to come dressed up. I can talk without being dressed up. You know, same way when it comes to parties. A lot of times I get invited to parties and people will say, oh, you can come dressed if you want. Well, to me, that sounds like work. Right. So are you inviting <laughs> him or are you inviting her? You know, I would never have a party and then invite my electrician friend and say, oh, and you can bring your tools if you want. <laughs> because those, those, those are the, that's their work stuff, right? You know? Right. And yeah. I'm going to the party to enjoy myself. If I go dressed, then there will be, I think there will be some expectations of me to entertain others. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, like I, you feel like you're on the clock in a sense when you're, when yeah. you're not. And I'm just here to enjoy myself as, a, as everyone else is at the party. That makes a lot of sense. And I, and I like how you, you put it in that context because um, that really does help people understand. And I actually really love the example about the electrician <laughs> and you can bring your tools. <laughs> right, right, yeah. You know, because even even like, you know, like I said, you, even like, you know, someone says, oh, you're a comedian. Oh, tell us a joke. You know, they really just want to put you to work in, in these, you know, basic uh, situations where it's just like, well, you know, it's like, <laughs> you're not asking anyone else to do their profession, you know, on the spot, you know, so it's like, don't, don't ask me. I'm, I'm just here to enjoy myself as, as, as a guest, just like everyone else, you know. Okay. Well, 
Well, great. Um, so one of the things that you're known for is um, Drag Queen Story Hour. So can you talk about that? And what does it mean to you? Like, what's the scoop? All right. So Drag Queen Story Hour is a nonprofit organization that started in San Diego, I believe, 2015 by a woman by the name of Michelle T. And um, and uh, a woman by the name of Rachel Amy saw it and she brought it. She wanted to bring the program to New York, I believe, late 2015, somewhere 2016. And um, and she was successful in bringing it to the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, And. they had a, a video that went viral. Mm. And so for many reasons, because you know people had never really seen anything like this before. So there was, you know, the people that were for it, people that were totally against it, you know. Anyway, so the Brooklyn Public Library was very pleased with the program, despite any of the backlash and what have you. Um, and they wanted to do more readings and other people were hitting her up for more readings, but she only knew two drag queens. I mean, like who only knows two drag queens? You know, what kind of life is that? And so um, <laughs> and so they put a, a call out on Facebook and I saw the video and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And they were looking for more drag queens. And I, um, I saw the post and I responded. I went to the training um, and then we had uh, background checks from the library and we get trained from the library staff about reading to kids, do's and don'ts with working with kids and things of that nature. And, um, and we were all set. And so my first reading was probably, uh, I'm going to say it was uh, late 2016 or 2017. I, I, I tend to begin. But the good thing about it is I can always double check because I, it was a small library in, uh, in, in Greenwich Village. And so my first day, they said, you're going to have about 75 kids. We invited some, uh, some pre-K classes and a kindergarten class and also anybody from the neighborhood who pops up. And I'm like, okay. And then before I went out, they said, oh, and also the New York Times is here to interview you. Oh. So like, no pressure on your first day at work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I can always go back to the New York Times article to say, when was my first day of work? Because it highlights that. And um, it went very well. The, the, the New York Times gave me a really great write up. Um, you know, how many drag queens get a chance to be in the New York Times. So that was awesome. And um, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, um, I, I, and I said during one interview, you know, like working with kids, it's like working with uh uh, drunk adults in a sense you know it's just like because sometimes they're just like all over the place you know and you have to rein them in but I really enjoy I enjoy the enthusiasm that they sh- that they show to have a guest uh before them and the curiosity they have with um with you know having someone you know uh the questions that they ask whether it's about the book or, it's, or whether it's the, the question is for me. Um, I think the program is great because it encourages uh, reading, you know. Um, you know, who doesn't like being read to, you know? And th- if there's a book that I read to some kids and they, they really like the book, and then, you know, th- maybe their parents or caretaker will take off the book for them or buy them the book, and they can attempt to, like, you know, to learn to read it on their own as well, too, you know. Um, I also believe that, Parents bring their kids there to to see someone who may be a little bit different than what they normally see, uh, which makes them hopefully more accepting of people and who are different and their stories who are different. Because if I read to the kids a story about uh, a little boy who has two dads, mm-hmm. you know, and now September rolls around and you have a kid in your class who has two dads, now it's not as as weird as it would have appeared if you had never heard of someone with two dads. And so this kid can now be an ally to any kids who may have never heard anyone having two dads and who may want to make fun or tease this kid about having two dads, you know? Um, So I think it opens them up to being more accepting and open-minded kids and hopefully that will lead into their adult lives, you know? Um, and I also believe that there are parents, and I know this for sure, that there are parents who bring their kids there because they feel that their kids are there, mm-hmm. or they know, or their kids, you know what I mean, have expressed, you know, feelings of being different or feeling different. Um, because I get a lot of inbox messages after events and or 
parents who will say, you know, like, you know, my kid has never, ever sat and listened so intently to a person before, you know, it really made blank day to, to meet you and to be, to be around you, you know, and all libraries uh, have story time, you know, so this is nothing new. This is nothing new. It's just like, and, you know, no offense to, you know, my library friends, librarian friends who may be reading this, it's almost like coach and first class. You know what I'm saying? So librarians, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a coach class, you know, but Drag Queen Story Hour takes it up a notch, you know. And of course, librarians, you know, like most of them, you know, this is their job. And they, they you know, not to say they don't put effort into it, but we come from a p- performer's perspective. And then you have all, you know, the bling and the colors and the shine and, you know, and the personality. Right. Um and you might not necessarily get that at a regular story hour in your library. I, I, I always try to like make sure I say this where I'm not, you know, like putting anyone down, you know, in a sense, you know, but we, I can say that from experience because the librarians will say whenever there's drag queen story hour, we have bigger numbers than when we have regular story hour. So there's some truth to what I'm saying. Sure. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you say is your favorite thing about working with kids? What is my, my favorite thing is just, um, just like I said, like, you know, <laughs> this is, this is funny because um, as, as a drag queen, you know, sometimes we don't get the love and the appreciation as performers. Sometimes when you're working in bars and in other situations uh, from the audience, you know, there's a drag show every Thursday at 1030 at club XYZ. Okay. And people come every Thursday at 1030 at Club XYC and the show starts and they act as if, oh, there's a show, you know. When you go to a, uh, 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 a live taping of, say, Wendy Williams or any other talk show, what do they do with that audience before the, before the guest comes out? They hype them up. What happened? When, okay, when Wendy comes out, what do we do? When, you know, we do this, you know, they give them the whole thing. Yep. I, you know, we're on a much lower budget. We don't have anyone to do that. So sometimes we don't walk out to the fanfare that we, uh, that we need to get the ball rolling. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? Unless you have reached uh, a status of a TV personality type person where people are excited to see, but sometimes as local, uh, as local Queens, we don't get always get that fanfare from, from the audience. And we, as entertainers, we feed off of energy, you know, we feed off of the energy from the audience. So to start us like, yeah, hey, I, I've, done, I've done all this work backstage for you all, you know, at least make me feel welcome, you know, turn around, face me. <laughs> so Alice said all that to say children are uh, so receptive you know you say hey we have our guest today everyone welcome this harmonica something and they are clapping and they're cheering and they're in awe you know and I know every audience of adults won't be like that but at least make us feel welcome and sometimes we don't always get that so that's why one big reason why I enjoy working with kids and only and because like, you know, we, we, we pretty much have for the ones that are old enough, we pretty much have their undivided attention. And I've had like I've done like daycare centers where they are like preschoolers and they just sit and stare and <laughs> like just trying to process everything. And to me, that's just as great as, you know, as you know, as anything else, just like they're like just quiet, just sitting there, just processing the whole situation. So I know I've done something well. <laughs> awesome. Gee, uh, you know, t- kids tend to be really uh, honest. Do you, do you ever get like direct questions from kids that are like, oh, are yes, yes. Oh, and boy. like, do they ask you? They do. They do ask us questions. And before uh, I would sometimes joke, give a very joking answer, but I was told that um, I need to be a little bit, I need to be a little bit more um, open and respond and and respond truthfully to the questions because the question is then left to be answered by either a teacher or a parent. 
Right. And sometimes and they don't always know how to uh, respond to it. So it's better if I answer my own questions because, you know, it's like you can ask a, co- a, a kid can ask you a question. He says, I'll tell you later. And then they, they will remember later to ask you again. So it's yeah. like you're not really brushing it off because I want to know the answer to this question. So <laughs> and so it's a lot better if the answer comes truthfully uh, from me. Right. You know? right. Um, as opposed to me being, you know, but that's just like, you know, the, 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 the comedian side of me, like I, I try to make the, uh, story hours engaging for the adults as well as the kids. So sometimes I may say some things that will go definitely over the kids' heads, but it's meant for the adults, you know, um, and it's all, all in fun, you know? Okay. Well, good. So there is a, a video that's gone viral on BuzzFeed. Mm-hmm. Our features books that cover topics like diversity, inclusion, and respect. Can you tell us about some of your personal favorite books to read for Story Hour? Um, well, there's a book called uh, Neither by an author from New Jersey, from Princeton, Arlie Anderson. Um, and um, uh, it, it's about... Uh, it starts off with two kinds, these bunnies and these rabbits, and they live together and um, and the land of this and that. And so one day there was, you know, <laughs> uh, an animal born that resembled the bunny and the bird. So it was like a bunny bird kind of situation. And the, 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 the bunnies and the birds kind of made this, this creature not feel very welcome because you're not rabbity enough. You're not uh, birdie enough to do the things that we do. And so they let the, the bunny bird left, you know, it's almost like when you have a young LGBTQIA person who lives in a small town and they don't feel they are being accepted or respected and they leave to go to the big city with more open-minded people or with people that they feel will, will accept them. And so that's what happens with this bunny bird. He goes to, uh, the, it goes to a place called like the land of all where there's all these different types of animals that are combination animals of like two different animals and um, find happiness. But they are also, there's also a bunny and a bird from the original place that come there because they also didn't feel quite comfortable there. So that's one of my books. It's called Neither. And I always say her name wrong. It could be Arlie or Airly, but Anderson, yeah. <laughs> and also there's another book called Worm Loves Worm uh, about two worms that are getting married and the other animals are helping them to plan this wedding, but they keep wanting to do everything so traditionally like oh who's going to be the bride and the bird both worms say i can be the bride i can be the bride well who's going to be the groom i can be the groom i can be no that's not how it's done and in the end of course like any old wedding you wind up getting fed up and (laughs) no matter what your mother-in-law future mother-in-law says and do the wedding how you want to do it and so they eventually did get married uh, because worm loves worms. And one of the kids says, but worms don't have mouths. How do they kiss at the wedding? And I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> this kid has been to a lot of weddings. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, before you mentioned LGBTQ and then you said IA, what's IA? Asexual and intersex. Okay. Yeah. Because I yeah. haven't heard that, and I just want to make sure for our listeners, uh, for anyone else. That was yeah, the, 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 the letters keep adding on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's a pop quiz every other month. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to keep up myself. It's, it's right. amazing. So, uh, well, you also work with a lot of other nonprofit organizations. Can you tell us about some of them? Um, yeah, the local, local, mostly local health agencies and also youth organizations. There was an organization here in, in Jersey City called Our Youth, and I hosted a, a lot of events for them. Also, uh, a, uh, like I said, mostly like very local organizations, uh, AAOGC, American, uh, African American, uh, AAOGC. <laughs> so many acronyms in this. In the in the health in the HIV organization, there's uh, uh, there's so many acronyms that it, you just 
you lose <laughs> focus on them, whatever. But um, also with uh, Colin Lord and uh, the Trevor Project. So, you know, I've done like different fundraisers and, and, and things for uh, Trinity Place, uh, places that, you know, just help. Because, you know, when, when I was coming out, there were no places for us to go to as, uh, and, and, and everything that's happening now with youth, as far as like uh, youth being kicked out because of their parents not wanting them anymore because of their sexual identity, um, that, that still goes on. But now there are places and resources where these young people can turn to so, so they're not out in the streets and being taken advantage of. Um, and things like that. So there are shelters and, and, and homes and organizations uh, that are willing to, to, to help them so that they can eventually grow and blossom and being the best adults that they can be, you know? So it's, so it's great. Even, even in school, uh, I go to a lot of, uh, do some speaking engagements at some schools, some um, uh, SGA groups, uh, 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 you know, the Straight Gay Alliance. They even changed the names of some of those to make it just, not about straight and gay and just like, you know, uh, where when you kind of get the message, but we don't say straight and gay in a sense. Um, those acts, those groups that meet after school and so these kids can talk and get things off of their chest and they can meet people. Because when I was in high school, I didn't, I knew of people who were quote unquote gay, but I necessarily did not uh, uh, put myself in, with them because I didn't really want to be labeled as gay. You understand what I'm saying? You know, say, so, so then you have the struggle within yourself. Well, I, I hear rumors about this person. So they're probably true because the same rumors that they hear about me are true, but I would never attempt to make friends with this person because then everyone will really know that the rumors are true. And it wasn't until, you know, like, you know, 11th, 12th grade that I finally, you know, like came like, you know, slowly became friends with people that I was uh, in high school with that were rumored to be gay as well. Okay. Yeah. So these these groups really help, you know, kids have a lot of pressure on them, you know, um, especially with uh, social media and everything else, you know, it, life can be really, really hard on them, um, especially when, when people, uh, you know, bully or tease or just like, you know, take advantage of these kids. So I'm glad that there are outlets for them to talk uh, and get their feelings out and meet other people who may share similarities. Yeah, that's really important. And I've seen a lot of that actually on TikTok where you'll see a kid saying, you know, they'll, they'll even record their parents in the background and it's horrific yelling and screaming at them because the parents just found out or the, the child just came out and the parents were like, no, you know, you, you, you can't be that way. You have to be the way I want you to be. It's, it's just, it's just mind, mind blowing. Um, yeah. Really, it's, it's hard to hear. It's hard to see. And, you know, I, I feel for uh, the kids that are going through struggles and they don't have the support of their families, their, their parents, mm -hmm. their siblings, the, the extended family, um, you know, and it's, it's really tough. So, and I know it is hard, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to raise kids regardless, no matter what they identify as. So, you know, so when you have these extra things, because no one, no one, there's no parenting manual that people get, you kind of like, you go from your own experiences and how you grew up and, you know, and hopefully you've had enough positive experiences where you are open-minded enough to work things through as opposed to just uh, tossing away a whole kid just because of something. Right. So can you tell us about your, your life as an, as an entertainer, specifically the comedy queen? Well, the comedy queen is something I gave my, gave uh, to myself a title. Um, and I, I used to say the queen of comedy, and then I just changed it to the comedy queen only because I want people to I, so when you when you when you hear my name then you kind of get what I'm about you know what I'm saying as opposed to like you know you're wondering and this and that and a lot of times you know um, there are uh, uh, drag performers who like you know who are great dancers or great singers or everybody brings something different to the table and when I was coming out um, you know that was that was my thing because um, 
I always had the ability to make people laugh, and make people <laughs> smile, you know. And so um, a lot of my uh, uh, performance and show is based, you know, on comedy, you know, and that's why I host a lot of events and things like that, because I can, you know, no matter what the topic is or what have you, um, we can still, you know, enjoy ourselves and get the point across. Okay. Oh, that's great. So <clears throat> as mentioned on your website, you've worked alongside musical artists such as Mary J. Blige, Jennifer Holliday, and Beyonce. What was that like working with them? It was really, really good. Um, and usually these were like, um, well, as far as everybody necessarily, except for Beyonce, um, I've done a lot of like pride events where I was the person to introduce them. You know, um, so that was always an honor to like, you know, be backstage waiting with this particular person and uh, okay, just, you know, and just chatting as regular performers do, you know, um, and then to be the one to be able to say, and, you know, I was gonna say ladies and gentlemen, but I don't say that anymore. Um, we say, I see beautiful people or, you know, anything that's more uh, gender neutral these days. So um, please welcome X, Y, and Z. And the person comes out, so it, it, it's 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 an honor and a pleasure to to do that for someone who's who's put their time into the um, into the industry and stuff. Uh, the situation with Beyonce was a little bit different because um, how that happened. Um, her stylist Ty Hunter would would play um, my. I used to sell these VHS tapes of me performing years ago, and so they would play them on the tour bus. Okay. You know, and so um, Beyonce was going to do a surprise appearance at this place called The Roxy. I believe this was 2004. In uh, New York um, City? Yes. The Roxy That's in there. New York City. Yes. In there. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know I have a question I was going to ask you. Which one was your favorite club in New York City back in the day? Oh, well, you know, it's funny because I used to like uh, U.S. Club USA, you know, Palladium, Palladium, all the big spaces, the big spaces, yeah. because I I like to be able to roam around, you know, I'm not much of a dancer, it just depends on the, the vibe of the music, but I'm a people watcher and I, I don't really like small spaces where, you know, I'm confined, I like to be able to roam around and see what's going on, so yeah, those those are two, and, and we don't have those mega clubs anymore because um, no, we don't. No, we don't. It's it, you know, it, it's different nowadays. But uh, let's see, um, Sound Factory, right? Yes, yes, Sound Factory and Sound Factory Bar, right? Uh -huh. Twilo, right. the Red Zone, Limelight. Yes, Limelight. and then there was a big rumor that they're trying to bring that back, but uh -huh. I, don't, I, I think that's just a big, big old rumor. I'm not sure. I kept seeing yeah. stuff during Pride Month. But yeah, we don't, we they're like those places are long gone. I, I just don't think New York City is, is built like that anymore. No, and, it's it's, and it's so expensive and everything else that if they don't get the support. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember all those places, uh, Tunnel, Tunnel was another mm -hmm. one. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> then there was Carbon, I think Carbon burned down. Oh, I'm not sure if I knew about carbon, but yeah. you usually a lot of times these places were they, they've had they've been reinvented so many times like, oh, OK, now they call it this. Oh, is that the old so and so, you know, yeah. so it's like. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I remember uh, Limelight was was in an old church. Yes. Yes. So. And then they after that, they made it into like a shopping mall. Oh, weird. Um, now it's a gym. That's so strange. Yes, you know, if those people only knew. <laughs> they only knew what was going on. All the shenanigans, like, right. <laughs> you know, it's like the good old days. I never mm -hmm. got to go to Studio 54, but I watched the movie. Right, yeah, and that, that was, that was, and I, uh, to um, the shelter. Um, I, I remember going there and what was the other, oh, uh, Paradise Garage. I went there at least twice before right. it finished, you know? So yeah, so many, so many wonderful party places. And, and the good thing about, you know, people just went out to really just enjoy themselves and to yeah. let go. I mean, and we would go out like seven, eight days a week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> could, you know. It was like Thursday night and each club you had your certain nights, like. Right. I I knew which night was what, depending on the club, right? So Twilo, it was like Friday nights at Twilo. 
uh, Sound Factory Saturday nights, Thursday nights at the tunnel, or you can go Saturday nights to the tunnel after hours. Um, <laughs> my night before it closed down was definitely great on Saturdays or Fridays, but you know, they all had their days of the week and then they have the after hours and then you come out and it'll be like 6 a.m. and people are like walking to church and you're coming out of the club. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> the original right. walk of shame, right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> like stinking like the nasty club. <laughs> right. Especially back in the day when they smoked and everything yeah. else. So it's just there like. You know. Yeah, yeah, I know. And uh, those were the good old days. So, um, well, good. So. You also have some experience in the music industry industry yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, three independently produced singles, ready to pump. I'm here to work, and this is the beat. Can you tell us a little bit about these songs, what they're about, and what they mean to you? Um, the songs were uh, when I worked. I used to work at a. Uh, I used to do a Sunday tea dance called uh, Sunbeam Sundays at a, a place called Esquilita on 39th and 8th Avenue in New York City. And so the owner, we, we wanted to come up with like some something to help promote myself. And um, so with one of the DJs, I wind up doing three individual, what we call like bitch tracks, where the person is not necessarily singing, it's more of a talking over music kind of a situation. And they were very, very successful. And it also got me lots of exposure. Um, um, and I think for me as an, as an older entertainer, one way to still connect with people of different ages, especially younger people is through music, you know? Um, because to this day, people will still say, oh, I play your songs and this and that. And I remember, you know, you should do more music and things. And I, and I think about it from time, I mean, like this was way before iTunes and everything else, you know? So, um, and, you know, I don't necessarily have all the rights to the music, so there's no way that I could like, you know, put it on iTunes at this point and stuff. But so it, it still lives, you know, uh, and I, I think uh, I still think about doing, you know, doing more music because uh, it really did uh, help uh, with uh, exposure and relevancy. So nice. And, and you've also done uh, some television shows and movies, too. Right. Mm-hmm. Honey, yeah. The Deuce. Please give. Um, how does acting compare to other entertainment work that you're used to doing? Well, um, it's it's oh, it's not as always as great and fun as it may appear to some people. You know, what I mean, there's a lot of hurry up and wait. You know, when you're on yeah. set, you're on set for quite some time. You know, and you don't know when you're getting off because you're at the you're at it's at the director's discretion about okay when we Watch. finally have that scene Camera. we may have Action. gone over the lines three and four different times and through th- uh three or four different angles to wow. get this footage uh and that's just for like a small like small roles you know so so i can understand why they get a lot of actors and actresses get paid the big bucks because it is a, it's, a, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of time spent away from your family and from doing other things. So um, yeah, it, it, it should be, um, but, I, but I enjoy it. I, I enjoy being in front of the camera. I enjoy uh, seeing myself on the big screen, like, if you make it. I mean, I went all the way to the premiere of a movie that I was in with, um, I was Brittany Murphy. Um, and, um, and I said, oh, I said, you know, um, I'm at the club when she first comes in and we have this conversation. And then, and so when the movie played, uh, the scene came up and she was already in the club uh, way past me. So I was cut out of the movie and I said, never again will I invite someone to the movie theater with me, like to have the see me, see me on the screen. And then it's like, oh, you didn't make the movie. But I mean, the great part about that is, you know, you still get paid and everything. It was Uptown Girls was the name of the movie. I saw yeah. that. And so, um, and so, yes, yeah, so that was my big disappointment that written my cracked face of like, okay, yeah, you were in the movie, but you weren't in the movie. <laughs> yeah. um, I love Brittany Murphy. I actually, um, over the weekend, I, I watched uh, the movie with her and Ashton Kutcher where they get married. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, she was one of my favorites. I, mm-hmm. I I cried when she and yeah, she had a she had a big feature ahead of her. Yeah, yeah, she did. Beautiful, talented. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was very tragic. But uh, 
but yeah, I mean, it's still fun when you're there on the set. Um, I know I've, I've, I've done some extras on stuff and uh, it is a lot of hurry up and waiting, sitting in a room with a bunch of other people uh, when I was an extra and mm -hmm. like people are reading, you know, they're staring at their phones, you know, just trying to keep busy. So I know how that goes. Um, do you have any fellow entertainers or activists that you would recommend to those interested in learning more about drag or the organizations you've worked with? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think there are a lot of, a, a lot of, um, there are a lot of individuals, uh, you know, who are activists uh, for in, in different areas that I particularly, uh, uh, and also performers as well too, like performers turn activists and activists turn performers and things of that nature, like Laverne Cox, uh, like Peppermint, uh, like Bob the Drag Queen, uh, just people who are who who came from the bottom and 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 you know were able to get catch a really great break and now they are still involved in the trenches, you know. And um, and these are people who are who reach back into the community to make sure that uh, that others others who are voiceless can be heard, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have a message to any of our viewers who look up to you and your cause? Well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say, you know, uh, be the best you that you can be and don't let others uh, run or try to dictate your life. You know, uh, we and, 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 draw, and put your hands into as many things as you can to see what works for you. You know, I uh, don't let fear stop you from living your best life. You know, a lot of times people will say, oh, I, I can never travel alone or I can, I can never go to the movies by myself. I can never go to, you know, it's just like sometimes we are our own best company. And, and a lot of there are a lot of people who put off doing certain things because uh, they don't want to do them alone. Mm. You know, and it's like. You, 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 we only get one life and you, you have to, and I would hate to live my, hate to be 78 years old saying, oh, I never went to Russia because nobody wanted to come with me. You know, they're two, they're two groups. You can go with a bunch of strangers who all have the same thing in mind and you might meet someone else there who is, which I've done when I went to Columbia, I was by myself, but I met other people who were traveling solo as well too. And we, and to, to, to this day, I still talk to some of those people, you know? Um, and so those connections, even, people who are like single who like think that they're naturally going to find their soulmate in Walmart, you know, it's like, okay, well, you got to get out there. If you're not out there. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Get out there, you know, don't be afraid, be adventurous. <laughs> that's great advice. So um, how can everyone find you on social media? When uh, you can find me on Instagram at H sunbeam. And, or you can put in a harmonica, somebody will pop up too, and as well as on Facebook under the same name or at my website um, and grab some merchandise while you're at it. <laughs> and the website is theharmonicasumbeam.com. Awesome. Well, it was so nice to meet you. And um, really was a, a nice, nice interview. And thanks for joining us and appreciate you having uh, hopefully you had a, a, a really great time. I had a great time. It's been my absolute pleasure. And, and I, like I said earlier, I'm glad we were finally able to make it happen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of A Breath of Fresh Marketing. And we'll see you soon. Be well. <laughs>